Kia ora. I'm Janet Abbott, the Visitor Host Supervisor at the Christchurch Art Gallery, and today it's my great pleasure to talk about Rona Hazard and a painting she did in the summer of 1927. It's called The Sing in the Bay, and it's painted at Camaray on the westernmost point of France, near Finisterre. Finisterre literally translates as the finish of the earth. Many of the visitors to the gallery remark on the number of works by women artists that we have on display. And I think the quality and the originality of this work exemplifies the strength of this aspect of our collection. Rona Hazard was a clever, talented, modern woman of the 1920s. And she trained in Christchurch, then absorbed aspects of modernism in Paris. Her bright, post-impressionistic style brought her international recognition, showing at the Paris Salon of 1927 and other significant exhibitions before her untimely demise. And most of this information um, comes from this great book, Rona Hazard by Joanne, um, Joanne Drayton, and um, I highly recommend that. So that's that one there. She began life, Rona Hazard began life in 1901 in Thames. Her father, Henry Hazard, was a surveyor with the Lands and Survey Department, and the family moved around the country as his work demanded. By 1910, they were in Hokitika and Rona began studying art with Hugh Scott, an artist over there. When war broke out in 1914, her father was transferred to Invercargill as Commissioner of Crown Land, and Rona went to Southland Girls High School. As the war progressed, her two older brothers joined the Royal Navy, and the youngest joined the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. While they made it home alive, her mother died in the flu epidemic that followed the war. The family moved to Christchurch in the following year. There, Rona enrolled at the Canterbury College School of Art, where she was considered to be one of the more spirited and promising of the Canterbury students. There was quite a group of women artists at the school. Eve Page, Rata Lovell Smith, Olivia Spencer Bow, and Naomi Marsh were amongst her friends there. They all overlapped in her um, studies at some stage. She was described as an original who thought nothing of sitting in the middle of the square with the traffic surging past her if she just wanted to sketch. Her work from this period is typical of the Impressionist style that was taught at the time, with its emphasis of seeing and painting what was really in front of you. By 1922, she was showing her work at the art societies in Auckland, Christchurch and Wellington. At the end of that year, she married Ronald Mackenzie, an art teacher at the school. She continued to study and exhibited under the name of Mackenzie for three years. This marriage lasted until a dashing young ex-army officer turned up in the life drawing class and she fell in love again. Undaunted and against the wishes of her father, she got a divorce from Mackenzie and married English artist Leslie Greener in December 1925. Greener persuaded her to treat life as an adventure and she didn't need too much encouragement. Born in South Africa, Greener had been educated at Sandhurst, served in the Indian Army, and had adventures in the Australian outback before he became an artist. They left New Zealand shortly after the wedding, visiting Greener's parents who lived on Sark, one of the smaller Channel Islands near Guernsey. From there they went to Paris and studied at the Academy Julian. This was one of the few art schools that accepted women students. In 1926, it was an exciting time in Paris. They saw the works of the post-impressionists and came into contact with the Japanese prints of Hokusai and Hiroshiga, which had influenced so many of the modern painters in Paris, including people like Van Gogh. Fueled with enthusiasm, they set out in search of subject matter in Brittany in the summer of 1927. Greener wrote, we crossed the lonely hills in the centre of Brittany, poking into the low-grade churches and wandering into the marketplaces until we reached Camaray, that little town of huddled roofs and gold and red sails that were an unending source of motifs for us, and which we claimed as our very own artistic discovery. At Camaray, Rona did his some of her best works, including The Sea in the Bay and Morning at Camaray and that's the one we're talking about today, uh, The Sea in the Bay and Morning at Camaray is in the Te Papa collection. And these works are considered to be her most interesting and advanced works um, at the time. 
The sea in the bay shows the jutting, rugged headlands at the most westerly point of France. Like a Hiroshiga print, it uses a high viewpoint and describes the landscape in a series of overlapping planes. There is an emphasis on the foreground rocks with interlocking areas of colour separated by darker lines. The simplicity of form and shape gives a decorative unity to the whole composition. The colour is pastel and high keyed with complementaries played off against one another. The orange sail, set against the turquoise blue of the sea, draws the eye in and across the bay. She uses full brush strokes laid down with a bold divisionist manner. They form a mosaic of colour that gives a decorative unity to the whole work. By the end of the year, Rona had gained recognition in France and Britain. Roger Fry's post-impressionist exhibition of 1910 and the one that followed two years later in 1912 had given British artists immediate exposure to the most recent developments in Paris. Rona's modernist style was close to that of the Camden Town painters in England. They freely distorted and simplified forms, but at the same time they remained true to outward appearances. She won a bronze medal at the Wembley Exhibition and the sardine fleet had been shown at the Salon in Paris. Leslie Greener did not excel as a painter in the same way as Rona, but his admiration for her talent encouraged her, and they appear to have had a close working relationship for six years. After painting in northern France, the couple were short of money. Leslie obtained a teaching position, teaching French and art at a boys' school in Alexandria in Egypt in September 1927. They moved there and they lived in a flat at the college. Many of Rona's works belong to this Egyptian period. Misfortune struck a year later. During a camping trip to Cyprus, Rona damaged her back and was in considerable pain much of the time. She returned to England for specialist treatment in 1929, but never fully recovered. The end came when she fell to her death while sketching from the Victoria College Tower. In February 1931. She was 31 years old at that time. Greener later disclosed that she was susceptible to depression but some mystery still surrounds the circumstances of her death. Despite this her work including the sea in the bay was shown to a now shocked Christchurch at the Canterbury Society of Art a month after her death and it travelled round to the um, Auckland Society of Art and the NZ AFA in Wellington the same year. The Sea in the Bay was purchased from the 21st annual exhibition of the CSA for 15 guineas. Paintings, horses and property were um, transacted in guineas at that time. That's um, 15 pounds and 15 shillings or about $31 in today's money. It was gifted to the McDougall Art Gallery when it opened by the CSA in 1932. The following year, 1933, Greener brought a collection of 40 of her works to New Zealand and toured the main centres. This memorial exhibition and the drama of her sudden death, which was compared to that of Catherine Mansfield's, aroused considerable comment. So the sea in the bay sits in the middle of this extraordinary artist's brief career. It provides us with some of the most vital aspects of modernism in New Zealand at the time. And ultimately, she's considered to be one of the finer artists to come out of the School of Art in Christchurch and to have made her reputation as an expatriate artist.